And I know a lot of us are living in fight or flight mode where our shoulders are tight and we're really tense. And if someone cuts us off or someone looks at us weird or someone comments something mean, we're triggered, we're, we're over the moon, we're just like freaking out and just to surrender that. And for the first time, maybe you to get out of survival mode and, and get into thriving mode where you deserve to live a life where you feel beautiful, you look beautiful, you feel confident, you feel excited to wake up, excited to go to sleep, excited to see your parents, excited to see your friends, your siblings, and you live a life where you can't wait till the next day, even though you're extremely present. That the moment you leave and say goodbye to your mom and dad, you can't wait to see them again. What's up, everyone, and welcome to another Mind and Heart opening conversation on Just Tap In. I'm your host, Emilio, and today we are joined by a genuinely heart-led leader and mentor who spent the last decade traveling to over 80 countries. BC Cerna has seen the beauty and the problems of the world and now he's here to teach both. In 2019, he launched his six-week mentorship program called Pursuing Purpose, which as of today, I just completed and I feel radically empowered and transformed from. BC has this knack for bringing world changers together and leveraging his emotions to make people feel heard, seen, and supported. He's personally worked with over 500 high school students and parents to build solid foundations for the next generation of leaders. As a filmmaker and storyteller, BC has been an active contributor to nonprofit organizations around the world and has even worked with top creators like Yes Theory to spread kindness. His project Traveling Good raised over $30,000 to take an RV, document good moments, and spread love to communities all around the US. BC has been one of those guests that I've gone to learn from on a very deep level. I've gone to see his authentic self and I truly highly admire the impact and transformation that he brings to this world. To keep learning from the world's most transformational teachers, subscribe to this channel to never miss an episode and continue your journey of growth and evolution. Also, make sure to like and share this conversation with someone if you learn something new. And without further ado, get ready to transform your pain into purpose with BC Cerna. BC, welcome to the podcast, brother. How are you? Amazing, man. Good to have you. Uh, yeah, so stoked. I'm doing well. I'm in Denver, Colorado right now, and it's beautiful. We had a foot of snow two days ago, but now it's 70 degrees out, so it's gorgeous. Awesome, brother. I haven't been to Denver. I still need to get out there. Uh, I'll be there soon, so I look forward yeah. to meeting you in person, brother. But I'm really, first I wanted to say I'm really grateful, uh, and I've told you this before, that I came across spontaneously through your profile i think i don't even remember how um but it was just like a serendipitous thing and we started connecting on instagram shortly ago i just joined uh, your mastermind group and we had our first call recently which was incredible it blew my mind uh, it opened my heart in many ways and that's really where i wanted to start with this whole conversation um i've heard in other podcasts that you've mentioned that this journey of becoming a heart-based leader has been a very spiritual experience for you. And, you know, we might not really know exactly when is the time that our, start, our heart starts to open, but I wanted to ask you, like around the time uh, when you were tapping into your heart more as a leader, what was that experience like? Why was it such a spiritual journey for you? Um, yeah, let's see. It, it's been a long journey for sure. Um, I'm raised in the USA where we are very, um, uh, cerebral driven, mind driven, um, you know, grades and sports academics. And so, yeah, it took me a long time to finally come around to the, the realization and the power of love, the power of vulnerability, the power of authenticity and leading from the heart. Um, uh, so yeah, I had a long journey playing sports growing up and, you know, being really bad in school. And so I, and I wasn't even that good at sports. And so I, you know, had a, a struggle with like, how do I do, even fit in? Like, I, and where, 
you know, am I, am I broken? Um, because I literally have, I didn't have good grades my whole life. Um, so I just didn't, and I thought I, I thought, and I didn't really fit in even on sports teams. I wasn't friends with any of them. And I was like, did I miss a meeting somewhere? Like, was there a meeting y'all had <laughs> that I had to fit in and I missed it? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. So then at 19 years old, I got a opportunity. I was playing college basketball. I got injured and I had an opportunity to do a study abroad program, travel the world. Mm -hmm. And so I traveled the world for six months in a study abroad program. Um, and while we were in Thailand, you know, just had this coming, you know, to God moment of uh, just helping people. Like we were helping communities there and orphanages and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't like a missionary thing. It was more just like actually helping and, and doing like education programs. Uh, and yeah, I just kind of had a sense of like, whoa, I could do this the rest of my life. Like this is, this is really powerful. Like I feel like, um, I'm usable in the world now because forever mm -hmm. I wasn't as good as sports or academics and didn't really do good in college either. And, uh, so I was like, wow, I could, I enjoyed this, like helping people and giving back. So yeah, that was like the start of it. I would say as like my heart being cracked open, um, to what, purpose and passion and, um, giving, you know, back caring about the world came from it started. And then it's been a long 14 year journey since then, mm -hmm. but continually just, it's really not about adding more things to yourself. It's just taking off more things. And so where you learned, you know, um, somewhere in sports or in the CEOs and the business world where, a leader looks like this, you know, mm -hmm. on the sports team, you're, you're, you're really well-spoken and confident and you have like this thing. But so my whole life was just undoing those things that I, that culture or sports or the world taught me about what a leader is. And so for me, it's just been peeling back the layers and getting to um, just the authentic self. Most people know um, when you meet someone, it's like the front of the business card, you know, there's like a business card. It has your name, your title, your yeah. phone number. And my whole mission is what's on the back of the business card. Like you mm -hmm. flip the business card over and be like, Hey, this is who I really am. This is what I am who I am. And the business card is just the facade, the perfume on, you know, what I'm trying to be. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a long journey. Like I, I, don't, I wouldn't say any like defining moments. Most of the defining moments is when I failed as a leader. Um, mm -hmm. the amount of times I wasn't a heart led leader, the amount of times I felt shame and guilt after leading from a place of ego or, um, leading from a place of, in, you know, just, my head up my ass. I'm <laughs> just like, you know, like I, like I'm trying to be a leader right now. Um, so most of the times I've learned about what a hard led leader is, is one, because I failed at it. And then two, I saw a man or a woman or someone leading from the heart that runs a million dollar company. I'm like, Whoa, if they could do it, I could do it. You know, hmm. it's incredible how many like similarities we share in our journey. Uh, I also, I told you grew up playing basketball and at 16 years old, uh, I grew up my whole life in the U.S. And I come from, both my parents are Colombian. And at 16, my dad tells me, hey, we're moving to Colombia. I got transitioned in my job. And at that point, I was literally, my dream was to play basketball for the rest of my life. That was all I ever did. It was either, you know, being with my friends or playing basketball. And obviously, in Latin America, basketball is not a, a huge sport. It's like if you're playing soccer, football, or you know, you're not really playing any other sports. So when I got here, it was about that peeling back of who am I now? Like I am still like a basketball player, but who else am I? Who else can I become? And when you started peeling back these layers in your journey, what did you find out about yourself? Uh, when you started peeling back and discovering things that maybe you didn't know uh, you had it in there? Yeah, I found, you know, I found out a lot of, um, you know, just coming back to the the pure, the purity of, of just being myself of like, I'm not liked by everyone. I have a goofy personality. I have a weird sense of humor. I have, um, you know, just my own flavor and, mm -hmm. I, and it's not likable for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And so just realizing more and more that that's okay, you know, just to be this like version of yourself that, um, is, is you. And, uh, yeah. So it was just coming back to that. It was coming back to like, Oh, like when, when I do this and someone doesn't like that, I do it. That's not me being bad. That's just, that's, that's, they don't like that about me and that's fine. Hmm. Um, and so I just learned about that, how to the authenticity of just always being yourself. And then, yeah, some people won't like you and accept you or, you know, receive you and that's fine. 
Hmm. And I feel like it's a difficult process to go down uh, when you start showing up as your authentic self. Like, because there's so many societal barriers and structures and norms that we have to follow. Like, um, when I started going down like a more spiritual path and I started like reading all these spiritual books, I held that in a lot before I, you know, started you know, putting it out right now as I am with this podcast and on social media because of that fear of what are people going to think? And if someone is going through that right now, what would you, what would you say to them? If they're, you know, like getting held back by this inner discomfort or fear, uh, that they can't show up as who they truly are. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the, the overarching, you know, moral of the story is just we're, we're paralyzed by fear and we are crippled by it. And, um, at one point, like I said, the, the, the yesterday's call, you know, courage is the number one virtue out of all virtues. Like we have different virtues and values, but none of them ex- don't exist without courage. And so courage is like, oh my, I guess the foundation to all of them. And so to have that courage, and that strength, um, you know, I would say, that, you know, just to continue to, uh, you know, read certain books, like just read books, man. Books mm-hmm. have the secrets of people that have been living this life for 40 to 50 to 80 years, and they have all the secrets mm-hmm. in a book, like for 13 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So read the books, Alchemist, obviously, um, mm-hmm. and and then uh, pursue the people, you know, the, the people you look up to and, and just try to find the heroes and the people that you're interested in and, and not not because they're famous or rich, but like really authentic, transparent, um, just real people. And mm. uh, yeah, that, that kind of helps the fear where you're like, okay, someone else is doing it. So now I have courage um, mm. or now I have hope that I can do it too. So hope is obviously the, the hope is the only thing that kills fear. A lot of people think love is, but actually hope is the only thing more powerful um, to, to kill a fear. And so when we're crippled as a society, whether politically or religiously or culture to become liberated, uh, we need to have hope and um, yeah. belief. And that's like from, uh, if you, if you ever read um, man searching for meaning. Yeah. 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 Powerful that's book. a big, uh-huh. yeah, that's a man searching for me and the guy that was in um, Auschwitz, the concentration camp uh-huh. um, during world war two in, in Germany. And he's like, I just had hope. I had hope that there, I, there was a life after this. Um, yeah. That's, that's powerful. I have to ask you for people that are like, what, what books should I start with? You mentioned the alchemist, a man search for meaning. Has there been a couple of books that you say, like you were going to give this to your son you know, when he can read, you know, like, what is it going to be? I mean, there's one book I probably have given to more people, um, for the, for the, like my twenties, it was called love does. And the author's name is Bob Goff. And I heard about the book one time. And then I was in Uganda in like Northern Uganda. And I was at this orphanage and apparently it's his orphanage. And there was like 20 of these books uh, sitting in the orphanage. And just cause he wrote the book and he owns, he runs this orphanage. I was like, Oh cool. I can probably just take one of these. So I, uh-huh. I took one and uh, he was there that day, but I didn't meet him cause I didn't really know who he was. And I read the book and it was just the most aha moment of my life where I was probably 24 maybe. And he's written four, he's written three more books since then. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's pretty well known now. Um, but yeah, that was the first book I read where I was like, Whoa, the, this guy lived it. A lot of people can speak on stages and sound really good. And, and a lot of people can write books and sound really smart. And, and some people can even speak on stage and make you cry, but, but to really see someone that puts the life, like the way they live, the way they approach their marriage, their parenting, their um, passion and, and their business, like everything. If you can approach it in a way that's very whimsical, very like kind of just grounded in the spiritual um, essence of joy and play, hmm. um, then I'm really inspired by someone. I'm really, I'm really like, oh, cool. Now I'm listening because that way you're living. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, that book was a big game changer for me for sure. Hmm. And I would, I would recommend that as well. Like always seek out people that you feel it, it it's usually like an intuitive feeling like a pull that they're living breathing walking expressions of their work and their truth and you know i've come through a lot of people like that in these last couple of years and i think that's what has shifted my 20s completely 
um, if I didn't have these like role models, people I look up to that have been pushing me along the way, you know, I, I don't know where I would be right now. And this is a perfect segue because I wanted to talk to you about mentors and how you've uh, sought out mentors, especially in your 20s. Now you're mentoring people as well. Uh, in your TED Talk, which we're going to link below, <clears throat> you you posed the question, how can we change the world? And you said those two things, you know, seek mentors and be a mentor. So I wanted to get a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, that's funny. So I, I was in uh, I was in Kenya when I got asked to do that TED Talk and I, I originally said no. I was like, oh, really? I was young. That was a long time ago. Huh. And uh, they came back to me while I was still there and they're like, hey, the TED Talk's in like two weeks. Um, can you do it? We would love to have you on this spot. It's in Atlanta, Georgia. And I and it was a TEDx talk. And I was like, sure. I was like, why not? If you're inviting me, like it must be some reason. So I, huh. I made that TEDx talk uh, by myself in, in about a week. Uh, but I, you know, just pose the question and it's a question I ask a lot of people. Now I ask a lot of people, um, whether it's like a, just a cool question of someone you meet or someone you, you know, for a while, but like, Hey, what would your TEDx talk be? Hmm. And it puts you in this seat of like, what is my 15 minutes in front of the world message? And so I'm sitting in Kenya and I'm like, Whoa, this is a big deal. This is 15 minutes. And let's just say it's the last message you're going to give to the world. Let's say you're going to die afterwards what is my 15 minutes on stage going to mean to someone? And so at that time I was traveling, you know, the world working for humanitarian projects and building, helping build schools and wells and, and um, all over Asia and, and Latin America and, and Africa. And uh, at the same time I was mentoring inner city kids in Denver. Hmm. And I remember sitting back, all right, what does the world need? What does the world need? What's my message to the world? And I was thinking about all these things I was doing around the world to really change the world, give clean water to people and give education to people that don't have those things. And it came down to mentorship. I was like, man, the most important thing in my life right now is mentoring these inner city kids in Denver. And I would fly back home as quick as I could on every trip I went on to so I could be with them. Um, mm -hmm. So if I was in Thailand, I wouldn't stay there for fun. I would literally do the nonprofit video and then fly back. Um, and so yeah, I was like, what, okay, why is mentorship changed my life more than any of these other things in the world? And it came down to the four things I think I said in that TEDx talk, which I would have to think really hard to remember them, but mm. it really came down to time, the world, myself, and, and there was a fourth one. I can't remember what it was, but um, yeah, just it, it's time travel. And that's what I mentioned. I was like, if you want to travel through time, a lot of people say you can't change the past. I, I think you can change the past by being the person you wish you had when you went through that heartbreak or losing your dad or losing your mom mm -hmm. or um, not being, you know, beautiful in high school or like not feeling, you know, feeling insecure because you're not good at sports. Like go do that for these young people in high school or in college or even young 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. And you will travel through time and heal that younger version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I mentioned time travel and I was like, yeah, it's just traveling through time. So all these high school kids I've helped over the last 14 years, which is now in the thousands, but deeply, deeply helped is in, you know, maybe the hundreds, but um, yeah, it's just, I was helping my younger self. I didn't fit in in high school. I was bullied. I was picked on. I was made fun of. I never had really like a, you know, good group of friends. And uh, I just became that for these, these students and um, mm. yeah, changed my life for sure. Yeah. I feel like when we're going through things in our life and we finally put like a label to it, like a word, for example, like you might not know you're procrastinating, but you you point out, oh, I'm procrastinating or I'm self-sabotaging. And then you kind of have that word for it. You start unraveling what it really means. You can work on it. And you just said like in these thousands, you know, mentoring thousands of kids, changing uh, younger people's lives. Have you noticed any patterns that, you know, people from the younger generations are going through right now that you could speak into? Yeah, young people, um, not only in the US, but around the world, but I, I would say, let's just start with the US. That's the one I've worked with closely. But young people in the US are, we all know at a pivotal moment in history of technology and the inner, you know, the intersection between mental health and technology, spirituality and medication, mm -hmm. um, science and spirituality, all these different things are like intersecting right now where we prided ourselves in America and the Western world of like, oh, you're sad, take this pill. Oh, you're fat, take this pill. We've now scientifically, we can change the DNA, we can change everything about you. 
And we're realizing that's not working. We're realizing that is actually not the answer is yeah. uh, medication and uh, just cerebrally trying to fix what we think are a problem. Sadness is not a problem. It is not a disease. So um, it is not like you're broken if you're sad uh, and same with anything. Right. And so, yeah, young people is just going through this moment in time where, you know, social media has, has been a, cr a crutch for them because my generation, we, I was raised without, it. I didn't get a phone. So I was, you know, in college, but uh, yeah, I think, um, hmm. yeah, I, it, it's very, you know, back to this simplicity of comparison. Like I didn't, you know, com we're comparing a lot. We're stressed. We're more anxious. We're more depressed. We're more suicidal. We're more, you know, susceptible to just realizing what we don't have. Um, social media has invited us into a space where we literally in one scroll of like three different scrolls, we see someone got married, someone had a kid, someone died, someone, uh, mm -hmm. country is at war. And within that three scrolls, the amount of emotions and chemicals, we, humans were never designed for that. We have nothing in our circuitary system or like our, our bodies to, to feel those four different emotions immediately. Um, where it's you're hopeless because there's a war, you're angry because someone attacked you, you're mm -hmm. you're happy because someone got married, you know, and all these different things. And so your body is just freaking out in this panic mode. And so it's trying to process what is going on because um, your subconscious doesn't know the difference between what is real and what's not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. And so my mission for the last 14 years is I bring these conversations and workshops into high schools. I teach kids about authenticity, about vulnerability. I always say the strongest person in any room is the one who's most vulnerable. And I've been in a room with 300 high school kids and a 15 year old high school kid comes up a little nerdy kid with glasses and kind of like, you know, scrawny. And he shares the, the, the horrific story about his mom and dad and something that's really intense that happened here in the States. And everyone's crying. We're crying. And you might look at the basketball players, the football players like, Oh yeah, they're stronger. They're taller. They look stronger. It's like, no, this 15 year old little scrawny kid is the strongest person in the entire room right now because of his heart and vulnerability. There's nothing. I can go lift weights. I can go make a basket, but to put your heart in front of 300 kids, that is invites 300 people to put their heart there. Mm -hmm. And so the strongest person in the room is the most vulnerable. So this 15 year old little kid just invited 300 people into their vulnerability and their story. And so, um, yeah, that's what I've been doing for 14 years now and really teaching kids how to identify the, the reason they're anxious and depressed. Like depression is this umbrella mm -hmm. and there's all these emotions in it. And right now we're just like, oh, I'm depressed. Here's a med here's a pill. Yeah. And, or, and therapy is great too. Medication can be helpful, but there's this umbrella right here that we're just saying depression, but there's all these emotions underneath this umbrella. And if mm -hmm. we can find out which emotion it is, then we can maybe heal it instead of just, you know, kind of mm -hmm. talk over it. Uh, and so for 14 years, I've been super blessed to work with thousands of not only high school kids, but parents. And I've been walking parents in this process of how to show up for the kids, how to love their kids. Um, and then for the students and the kids, how to show up for themselves and love themselves and identify why is it that they're anxious, depressed, they can't sleep, they're overwhelmed, any, you know, they're shameful, they're guilt, whatever hmm. it might be. Um, that's so powerful what you mentioned about like kind of wearing your heart on your sleeve. Uh, I feel that as as men, we're not necessarily encouraged to do that so much in society or or past generations or our parents uh, haven't really shown us how to do that. Uh, you know, just going off like what I most recently remember yesterday, the way that you showed up on the call was 100 percent with your heart on your sleeve. And and that's what really, you know, hit people, I think uh, hit me uh, personally. I wanted to ask you if you remember the first time that you, you know, put your heart out into the world or with someone or with a community and how did that feel for you? Yeah, I would say it was probably in the space of mentoring and when, when my dad died and that was probably, you know, that moment of like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this, you know, I've had hardships being bullied and not fitting in, but my dad passing away and, and sharing that with my high school students and sharing that with, um, you know, myself and, and just what, you know, we can't think our way out of problems. Like I think we've been, we've, we've, 
we've hit a point where we're thinking it's all about consciousness and like, okay, I, I, my heart is broken, but I can think my way out of this. You know, like these books that I'm reading, like they, they'll tell me I can, I can outsmart my dad dying or my mom dying or my dog dying or getting my heart broken. But the truth is we can't, we're, we're emotional beings. Uh, first and foremost, we're mostly emotional beings. Mm. And so the beautiful thing about being human is you cannot run or escape from being human. Uh, you can try, but man, there's no one escapes it. No one escapes heartbreak, losing a parent, losing a loved one, um, compassion and for a war going on or whatever it might be. So you can't think your way out of these, these, these problems. And so, um, yeah, I think for me, I, you know, hitting that moment where I lost my dad and telling my high school kids and, and just feeling cathartic about it. When you, when you finally share something to someone, whether it's something you're shameful about an addiction, you have, a, uh, something you've done that was really shameful. Um, and you just like, it's like stuck in your throat and everything in your heart is trying to push it out of your throat into your, into the world. And then everything in your brain is trying to force it back down into your body. And in the moment you finally find this safety and, and security to do it, you have this cathartic energetic release that your brain couldn't have never thought out in a million years. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think, uh, that was probably my starting point, but mm -hmm. I think from the last 14 years, I've done it many more times with, uh, hundreds of students and, and, countless amount of people yeah. and i imagine every time you do it it gets it gets easier or it gets it, it reveals more healing the more you do it totally yeah i mean there's always new ceilings and new levels to it whether it's a fresh heartbreak um you know and and just you know being aware that uh you know pain and, and difficultiness will happen but i've definitely learned how to share it with like it's on my sleeve mm -hmm. um and so now when i i get heartbroken or discouraged i just share it like it just comes out, you know? So yeah, I've, I've gotten better at it. Um, but I'm still very emotional. So I'll still cry through something and feel something. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've gotten better at just being like, Oh cool. This is just going to flow from my heart, uh, mm. to the point, you know, sometimes you, you can overshare or over uh, have too much money emotions, but yeah. Yeah. Here, here's something that just came up for me as you were sharing that is like, you know, over the past couple of months, I've done a lot of healing from, you know, heartbreak from, business partnerships that didn't work out and things like that. And I started, you know, meeting people and, you know, when I would meet them, I would just, you know, my heart would be like, here it is, you know? Uh, and sometimes I don't know if there's like a boundary that you have to set in terms of how much you can share with other people or who's sharing. Cause another factor is who's receiving that information, um, you know, does that person have the consciousness to be able to receive and hold space for you? Um, and that's something like I've I've worked through a lot, like really being conscious of, all right, can I share this right now? Uh, does it feel right for me? Um, and yeah, I don't know if, if you have any if you have any thoughts on that, like in terms when it comes to being fully in your heart. Of course, we don't want to like block it with certain people but it's how does that process look like in terms of oversharing yeah discernment um you know discernment's important same with if you're jumping off of a waterfall if it's safe to same if you're going to touch a hot stove and it's going to burn you we all have discernment uh and so obviously with humans there's a lot there's a lot more variables if they're if they're emotionally conscious or aware or you know um just uh playing your cards right of, you know, it, it, it's, it's just trial and error at the end of the day, you know, mm -hmm. you know, sharing your mom, you could share your mom or your dad, Hey mom, I'm feeling depressed or sad. And they're like, what do you, what are you feeling depressed for? You know, like, mm -hmm. and, and it could be an invitation to challenge you to challenge them. Um, mm -hmm. or it could just go way over their head and, and, you know, it's not safe. It is not somewhere, you know, to ask your parents about spirituality maybe, or about depression or, um, so, so that's fine. That's okay to, to be like, oh, cool, they're not there yet, or this person's not there yet. Um, and then just realize that that there's no shame on them. Like, you're not going to judge your parents or your friends uh, for not being evolved. They only know what they know, um, and they're only trying their best with what they know. And so there is no shame for someone uh, that doesn't feel like they care. Um, they just don't know how to care. Uh, and so having tons of empathy and compassion for our parents, for our siblings, um, for our coworkers, for everyone being like, oh man, they, they don't even know that they're, they're addicted to something or that they are ashamed or they feel something like, so 
let them be them and let them carry that on, but don't shame them or try to change them, you know? Mm -hmm. But, and I think yeah. when people are in positions of like leadership or influence, especially now on, on the internet that, you know, you could, you could have an influence like this quick and, you know, how do you prepare yourself for that? And that's, you know, a great, great segue also into this leadership concept um, where I'm learning right now as, you know, if I'm in a position where I'm leading and I'm from a very young age, I felt that I've had to, you know, be responsible, you know, over responsibility for other people. And I realized that when people are going through something, I may have the knowledge or what I did in that position, but sometimes it's not the best to even, even tell them that information because it's their journey. It's their path. I feel like for, for someone in a leadership position, it's more about, how can you guide that person into finding their own light, not you putting yourself in this position of, I need to fix them, you know, I need to save them, this like savior mentality, because we feel more important that way, right? It's, it's, a, it's a healing process that we have to go through um, for, for creating better leaders in our society. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Re re religion, you know, has always shamed people, you know, to, oh, you need God, you need Jesus, you need Allah, whatever it is. And and science is now doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So science is like, oh, you need medication, you need that, you know, it's this, oh, you're, you're a narcissist. Like they label these things, you're bipolar. And, and science is the same thing religion's doing, where it's not listening to the person, it's not hearing the person, it is prescribing um, God or medication. And so, you know, really being like, wow, science is doing the same thing religion's doing. So, so the heart and the mind are doing the same thing. And it's not until we combine and equally yoke and, and make, you know, what I always tell people is the greatest distance you'll ever travel is 18 inches from your head to your heart. And when you finally make these 18 inch journey, when you connect these two things in the most authentic, vulnerable way, every time you feel an emotion or you feel anger or jealousy or shame or love or whatever it is, you take it up here, you filter it through discernment and consciousness, and then you receive it back. And every time you're, you're angry or you're hatred or you're overthinking something or you're anxious, you take it here and you go, okay, I'm, I'm feeling ugly today. I think I'm ugly. And then you're like, okay, I'm beautiful. I'm loved. I, I it's, it's not my how I feel, I think I look. And so it's all about this communication, opening up this channel and mm -hmm. both are at war. Same with science and religion, right? They're at war with the, since the beginning of time and same with these two things, which is that. Um, and now we're at a time in our, in our evolution with not even Joe Dispenza or anyone, you know, all these people it's, it's, Oh, whoa, we need each other to learn from one another. And mm -hmm. now we have tools, scientific tools that now has been like, oh, these things of spirituality and religion have been right for thousands mm -hmm. of years. And now we know that with the heart being the epicenter of energy. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's beautiful what's going on now. Mm -hmm. And they've even measured now through science, science is that the heart actually contains neurons, not in the way that the brain contains neurons, but it does indicate that there's a certain intelligence to the heart. But, you know, someone like Dr. Joe Spencer, he says, like, you know, you know, thoughts are the language of the brain and then feelings are the language of the body of the heart. And another sh guest that we had on the show, it was really interesting. His name is Mo Gaudat, which is incredible because someone yesterday on the call uh, mentioned that they wanted to have dinner with him. And I want to I want to help make that happen. But he basically he lost his son. Uh, he was the you know, former chief business officer of Google X and he lost his son and it was just a tragic journey. But he basically, he dedicated his whole life to studying happiness. And he said, he was this tech guy and he said, I can build a formula and an algorithm for happiness. And when we had our interview towards the end, something that really stood out to me, he said, that you know what will heal society the most is returning back to the feminine side and i wanted to read a quote that i saw on one of your on one of your instagram posts uh which goes along the lines of of the feminine um side and it says we all enter into this earth realm through the feminine portal 
And it's not until we reconnect and realign with its foundations that we as men can heal and not hurt, protect and not pray the feminine energy toward fully expressing and experience this human life. So it hits. Damn, deep. I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you channeled I it. That. <laughs> I knew, it came I mean, through yeah. you. It came through you yeah. for sure. <laughs> what post was that? Was that about? I think it was a post with uh, Isa. So oh, okay, coming cool. along those lines. Yeah, I gotta go back and make that a little like image. That'd be cool. But uh, mm. yeah, that that I mean, I definitely had an emotional experience. I went to the desert um, at the beginning of like a year and a half ago, and. Uh, turn my phone off and turn social media off. Um, I spent about 40 days, like two months in the desert. I saw over 40 days and uh, yeah, I had an emotional experience with the feminine energy. Actually, I mean, it might sound woo woo for a lot of your, I don't know, your followers are more cerebral and not and stuff, at all. But this, <laughs> Trust this, me. Yeah, not, <laughs> yeah. But it might sound woo woo. And I'm sure even to me, it sounds crazy, but I had this moment where the full moon came up and it was this huge pink full moon. I was fully sober um, not only just from any, you know, substances, but from my soul, like my soul was sober. And I always tell people to sober your soul from social media, from buying things, from looks like I had my beard grew out. I, I uh, didn't like the way I was looking technically. And, um, uh, I was dirty living in, you know, a van at 32 years old in the uh, desert, um, going through a lot of emotions and realizations and who I was and what I wasn't. And, uh, just started crying and had this emotional moment and going through like this, um, like this emotional portal of the feminine and uh you know realizing gratitude for my mom my sister all the women in my life and had that moment of like wow we literally the the, the unbalance in the world right now from from politics to um business to all these different things the reason there's a feminist movement is because men haven't showed up we have boys that are running the country and running businesses um we have 30 year old bodies of they look like men, but there's boys walking around in the bodies of 30 year old men right now. Mm. And that's the, that's in my opinion, probably one of the worst pandemics um, is we have a generation of, of there's no boy into manhood. Like we don't have any ceremonial ritual traditions where you go from a boy to a man, from a, from a prey to a protector. Mm. And so, um, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah. So anyway, I, th I think there's right now, even in the masculine development space, there's the word alpha and beta being used and all these alpha men with beards and muscles and money and hunting deer and whatever. Mm. They're like, don't trust beta men, this beta men, this. And I'm like, yo, oh. you're not, you're, that is, you're make you're literally proving the point, you know? And mm. so, uh, in that dance of divine masculine, to identify the power in the feminine. The reason that men are so addicted to pornography right now is because we're so mad at our moms, mad at our high school crushes, mad at our ex-girlfriends. Like we, we're so addicted to sexual energy that is tied to the, to the woman's you know, vagina and the woman's breast that we're like just addicted. 80% of men, 70% of men or whatever is addicted to porn, at least in the US. And um, it is because of this unbalanced, unhealed, unlike identified trauma to the feminine energy. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's just coming back to it, coming back mm -hmm. to vulnerability, authenticity, all these feminine, um, assets that, uh, that mother nature, the Holy spirit, um, all these things that are caring and nurturing possess that we thought we had to go dominate and control and build our egos around. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so fascinated about that topic. And, I've also heard about this, you know, concept of like, we don't, there's no transition between boyhood and manhood. Um, what would that look like on, on like a more practical level? Like if you were, would you run like ritual ceremonies to get boys into, I know there's a lot of cultures that already do this, that we don't, you know, we, we don't see in the mainstream uh, media, but maybe if you've had an experience with that or, or what would you do uh, differently if, you were about to yeah transition. ritual i mean yeah i mean thousands of years country or uh, culture has been doing it for thousands of years you know and and tons of rituals and traditions and ceremonies um mm -hmm. yeah we don't have anything like that in our states you know when, when i work with with um young teenagers to adults to 40 year olds uh, i've worked with 70 year old men before in my programs mm -hmm. and uh, it all comes down to just healing the heart asking the questions you know when did your dad 
tell you not to cry? When did your mom, you know, tell you that you didn't look good? You know, just going back to these questions of like, do you remember the moment you thought you looked different? Do you remember the moment that first girl that you liked didn't like you? And going back to those moments of what you thought a man, you remember the moment you got tackled on the football field and hurt and everyone made fun of you, you know, just going back to these moments of when did you feel unsafe and unseen and, and can we talk about it, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then there's, there's different beautiful, like, you know, even spiritually the baptism, you know, of like the ceremonial, like, all right, I'm, 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 you know, there's some cultures, there's a movie where this, you know, this, uh, boy is in this white boys in this, this tribal village being raised and the ants have to come and all these fire ants come bite his whole body for like the whole night. And then, uh, the next morning he's a man and it's like oh, this wow. whole ceremony of a tradition. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's in the Amazon. Like it's, it's a really uh, crazy thing. I mean, normal for them, but uh, yeah. So there's so many different things, that, but like through the pain, like all night, these ants are biting you. Like it has to go through this pain. It's like, and that's why most men don't ever evolve unless there's a heartbreak involved. Like most men will play small in this boyhood, you know, money and sex, pornography, all these different things. And then they finally get this woman that they're like, whoa, this one's amazing. And, but they didn't ele elevate enough. And so they, she left him. And then he's like, whoa, I really got to work on my shit. And you could be mm. 25, you could be 35, you could literally be 55 going through a divorce right now being like, I got to do the work now. So yeah, no one escapes it. No one escapes it. I mean, huh. some people I'm sure go to their deathbed with the mask still on and the money is still, you know, stacked up. But uh, maybe it's that moment before they pass where they're like, shit, you know? Mm. And it's also like that process of the hero's journey. Uh, you know, when we started the, the mentorship, you said answering the call. That's that's one of the first steps of the hero's journey, like call to adventure. And I know you, you know, you uh, in your 20s, you were living with the yes theory guys and things like that. Uh, we're not too long ago, actually. I, I don't really know exactly the date, but, you know, they're all about, you know, seeking discomfort and, you know, going doing experiences that are going to could feel painful like these guys are jumping in the ice with Wim Hof and doing different things so it's that power of pain that I wanted to speak into or discomfort that that really allows us to keep growing and evolving because without that we can't stretch our boundaries we can't stretch like what we think our perceived limits are hmm yeah, totally. Yeah. The human, um, consciousness, uh, you can also call it the ego. Um, it, it is to protect us and it is to keep us aw alive. That's all it was designed for it to do. It wasn't designed to love. It wasn't designed to, um, uh, you know, make money or I mean, unless money protects us and keeps us safe, but it was really just designed for survival. Um, even down to the biological sense of, um, procreating with a woman. Um, and so, you know, when you stay enough in your mind, your thoughts, your cerebral, then it is really easy to be disconnected uh, to purpose, to uh, pleasure, to passions, to um, fulfillment and meaning. And so, uh, yeah, it's all on the other side of what is keeping us safe um, and what is keeping us uh, away from engaging in the mysteries and the magic and the wonderment of life, like the whimsical life we have to offer is uh is there it's just this it was not designed to understand it um and so yeah it's the journey 100 <laughs> percent. and uh yeah i mean speaking about you mentioned purpose and I, I think that's a great way to start like ending this beautiful conversation um because you know you have their podcast pursuing purpose and a lot of the things that you talk about are about, you know, discovering that and w what does purpose mean? And just the first thing I wanted to speak into um, for a lot of people, I think this happens is our parents don't normally support what our passions are or our purpose is. Um, maybe not on a like, because they don't want us to pursue it, but because there's a fear underlying it. Um, I wanted to let you kind of unravel why that happens, um, especially, you know, with our parents, especially, um, why, why does that happen? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Spending 14 years working with thousands of, uh, high school and college students and young adults and, and, you know, working also with hundreds and hundreds of parents, um, and just the, the biological, the cultural side, uh, you know, parents at the end of the day, 
they have one mission, you know, one mission, that's it. Biologically, their brain knows I have to make sure that when I die, I, my kid isn't going to be homeless, hungry, alone, afraid, all these different things. That's all their biological knows. The cultural part tells them if they're not going to be hungry, homeless, afraid, and alone, culturally, they need to have money, a job, a wife, a house, all these different things. And so that's all they know. The subconscious of your parents, if your parents actually haven't healed their heart, done the trauma therapy, done the work, done the inner child healing. If your parents haven't done that, all they know is when they die, you can't be homeless, alone, hungry, and afraid. The formula for that is marriage, wife, kids, college degree, all these different things. And that formula doesn't work for our happiness, our passions, our purpose, like not right now, not the way our cultural and biological understands it. Obviously, when you pursue photography or blogging or social media, whatever it is, it will pay and it does. And there's a world of that, but it's not, it's not normal yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, are the friction of why can't what I love to do and my happiness and my parents ever connect? And the friction is like these opposing magnets because, uh, they're not supposed to, even if your parents Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I just want my kid to be happy and go get a job and buy a house. You know what I'm saying? Like it it is like, uh, and sometimes there are parents that are just, yeah, whatever you want to go do, son, go travel the world, go drop out of college. And that's dope. Um, I would say that's not the case. 99.9% of the time of that, the thousands of people I've worked with and the Mm -hmm. stories I've heard. And I feel like we think that that friction is going to go away once what we're pursuing becomes a massive success so even if we're doing our passion even if we're pursuing it we're actually doing it for the wrong reasons we're doing it to prove them that it works or that they're wrong uh so that's another thing that just came up for me with that Hmm. yeah potentially i mean yeah it's it's i mean if you can if you can you know have the courage to disappoint your parents or society or culture or your classmates um and go pave another way then then power to you, whether it's a chip on your shoulder to get back at your parents or not, um, power to you for, for just doing it. So what would you tell people, um, when it comes to purpose, what would you tell people to do or be whenever it comes to pursuing their purpose, even if they don't know what it is yet? Totally. I mean, yeah, to, to figure out what is going on in the world with how you show up from your, uh, to your relationships and romance, to your business, to work, to a a person in society, to figure out what's going on here. you got to figure out what's going on here. This is the only world you have control over the one inside of your heart. This is the only, and the one inside here, like your whole body, the only world you can control is here. You can't control the stock market, the finances, the corruption, the wars, but you can control this one. And so you have two options. You either live a life where this external world dictates your internal world, or you go within And you create a world and a kingdom of heaven in here. And then this world dictates what's going on in the external world where you have a peace that no one can steal from you, whether they take your money or your house or your citizenship and you flee your country, you have an internal freedom and peace that even a guy that was locked in Auschwitz for years, taken his name, taken his family, killed everyone he loved, and he had hope and he had peace somewhat of peace and hope with inside of him. And if someone in Auschwitz and during world war II can have everything taken from him and still have that peace and that hope, then, and then anyone can. And so really being like, let's figure this world out because this is the only one I control. And this one will dictate this one way more than this one should dictate this one. That resonates so much with me. Uh, that's literally like, if someone were to ask me, what does just tap in the name of your podcast mean i would show them what you just said because it's exactly Uh it's exactly that and um when we wrap up every single podcast we have this little segment called the final trio which are really you know short burst rapid fire questions you can answer them in a word or as long however long as you want um but i wanted to ask you uh yesterday in your mastermind group we were led through a short prayer um by you that really just you know had me in tears and if you if you feel called to right now to just kind of integrate all of this podcast with a short you know however long you want to make it a prayer uh for the listener for people that are out here um feeling your words and your, your energy um i'd really love to give them a little sample of that and 
also that's what they're going to get when they're getting mentored by you um so i wanted to open up a space if you feel called to yeah well if you're listening um congratulations uh i would say first and foremost congratulations on being someone part of the uh small percentage i would say less than one percent of someone who actually is doing the 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 work of living an intentional life of reading the books listening to podcasts asking myself hard questions seeking people to follow that are inspiring and and like yourself and and so i want to say congratulations first and foremost for listening to this podcast as uh your heart is on a journey that um your future self is extremely proud of you um so congrats second of all i don't know if you're driving or you are at the gym or uh doing a workout um or you're at your house uh just chilling drinking tea but uh, yeah, we could do like a little prayer meditation if you want to. I'm down. I'm down. All right, cool. Well, if you're listening, um, congratulations. Um, I love you and uh, I celebrate you. Uh, if you could just take some really deep breaths and just really intentional. If you're at the gym, if you're driving your car and just really take a couple really deep breaths to get inside your body and just for maybe for the first moment, um, for the first time in a long time, um, you're just closing your eyes. Uh, not if you're driving, don't close your eyes, but, uh, if you're somewhere where you can lay down or sit up straight and, uh, and just really be intentional about your breath and your body and where you're at and really check in with, am I running around today? Am I trying to accomplish too much? Am I trying to please too many people? Am I trying to um, eat too fast? Am I trying to work out too fast? Am I trying to stop hanging out with my mom too quick? Am I trying to get on social media? Am I trying not to make my bed? Am I trying not to text someone back? Am I trying not to forgive someone? And just keep breathing, asking yourself these questions. And maybe for the first time in a while, you've just sat in stillness and silence um, with yourself. And as these emotions come up and these feelings and these thoughts of who I, who do I have to text back? Who do I have to not text back? Who do I have to not serve and people please and bend over backwards for who should I forgive? And just to sit there with that and just be in the present moment in the peace and the stillness and surrender of letting go of control. Surrendering control, letting go of forcing things, forcing friendships, forcing people, forcing emotions, and being in flow. As you sit there in the present moment where real freedom and peace exists, knowing that this is all that exists, this is the only moment in your life you have, and how you show up to this very moment is how the future will be determined. Now you might be thinking five steps ahead. You might be thinking 10 steps ahead of so many different situations in your life, but none of them exist because you're not showing up to the present moment with intention and purity in your consciousness and your mind and your heart. So as you go throughout your day, move in flow, not force, move in peace and freedom and surrender. And I know a lot of us are living in fight or flight mode where our shoulders are tight and we're really tense. And if someone cuts us off or someone looks at us weird or someone comments something mean, we're triggered, we're, we're over the moon, we're just like freaking out and just to surrender that. And for the first time, maybe you to get out of survival mode and, and get into thriving mode where you deserve to live a life where you feel beautiful, you look beautiful, you feel confident, you feel excited to wake up, excited to go to sleep, excited to see your parents, excited to see your friends, your siblings, and you live a life where you can't wait till the next day, even though you're extremely present. That the moment you leave and say goodbye to your mom and dad, you can't wait to see them again. So God, I just thank you for this body, uh, this health, 
I thank you so much for this person listening that they have the ability to listen, not to only our podcast, but music, um, the ability to see colors and, and the ability to feel and hug people and they have a healthy body. Uh, so I thank you so much, God, for their body and for their mind and heart for being in this podcast, uh, being sitting here with us. And uh, we are sitting there with you. And I know your ancestors and people that have lived for generations before you have been waiting for the moment for someone like you to heal the generational trauma, the generational curses, uh, and to just to start to ask the hard questions. Even though you might feel like you're just beginning, um, in reality, you are further along than you could ever fathom. And so uh, to forgive, to move forward in peace and play and to um, enjoy every single day that you have on this earth because it goes extremely fast. Uh, amen. Amen. I've seen that we're conditioned by a society to feel emotions that make us feel separate from where we came from, which is this oneness, this wholeness. We came from source, from God, or whatever whatever word you want to use for that, but we've been conditioned to feel emotions that make us feel separate or in fear or in lack. And doing something like, like that, like this prayer, where you mention all the things in our life that are good, that are you know, amazing, that make us feel gratitude, that make us feel that wholeness once again, I start seeing how the more we tap into these elevated states, these elevated emotions, we attract more of that. And you said it yesterday on the call, become what you want to attract. And when you're constantly getting into these states of just feeling this gratitude for life, you will get more of that. So I just wanted to highlight that and thank you so much for for leading us um, with that. And you know, before the final trio, I just wanted to open a space for you to uh, tell people where they should find you, what you want to announce, uh, anything special coming up for you that you want people to uh, go to if they want more from BC, uh, anything really that you feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Share. Shoot me a DM on Instagram, BC Cerna. Um, my movement uh, that I created uh, like three and a half years ago is called Pursuing Purpose. And we host in-person retreats. We host online masterminds uh, with people all around the world. We've had over 130 people come through our programs and retreats from over 25 countries um, from ages 16 to 45 uh, in three years. And so, yeah, we've been super blessed and God's been doing some really cool things with pursuing purpose. Uh, so if you want to do an online program where you get to hang out with us more and learn more about what I talked about, and then if you want to come on a retreat, stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, and I just joined the 4.0 mastermind and I'm really, really hyped about this. Uh, I can already tell the energy in the group is incredible. So I encourage people to look into that. Um, final trio. The first one that I wanted to ask you is what makes you uh, come alive and in your purpose? Uh, what makes me come alive and in my purpose is people playing and laughing. Um, I love people dancing. Um, I throw a lot of music dance parties and um, it just lets us forget about all of the pain, the worries, the hurting. Um, so when we get back to our inner self, our inner child, um, we can just play and dance and watching people just laugh and dance uh, and have a good time is, is my, my mm -hmm. highest excitement. Yeah. And a quote you said yesterday was, you know, your relationships are your wealth. So you know, always remember to take care of those people around you. The second yeah. question uh, I had to ask is the time travel question. Um, what would you tell yourself? Short advice uh, to yourself in your 20s. Yeah, if I were to talk to my 10 year ago self, my 23 year old self, I'd be like, hey, bro, um, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know you're excited. I know you want to help a lot of people. I know you're you have a chip on your shoulder to prove to yourself to someone. I know you are going to run really fast and bulldoze, bulldoze through any door or house um, or person that gets in your way. Um, so just be, uh, be intentional and thankful for the people that believe in you and support you and love you. Don't forget about your parents. Don't forget about your siblings. Don't forget about people that were, you know, 
believed and loved you before you, you know, had a, some sort of social following or presence. Um, and just like, yeah, go, you know, move, move as fast or slow you want to go, but move with as much intention as possible. Mm. This kind of ties in your answer to the first and the second question, which is I heard uh, Amar from Yes Siri. He said uh, the other day on a podcast, he said, you know, if you were to ask someone, is it the journey or the destination? You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's the journey or whatever. And he said, no, uh, it's the people, you know, it's the company that the people around you. And that's something I'm realizing right now. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this podcast. I'm getting into this content creator space. And, you know, I, I see the destination, right? I see where I'm going and the vision is clear. Um, but it's just like going back to that, like who's around me right now? Who can I trust right now? Who is supporting me on a soul level, that soul family that we talk about? You know, who is there and just, you know, giving your energy more to that than who you want to become like accolade wise, label wise in five to 10 years. So it's kind of reshifting that perspective. And the final, final question for you today, BC, is what legacy do you want to leave for the future generation of heart-based leaders? Yeah. I mean, the legacy of just play and love and nature and people and just the legacy, you know, like uh, Tony Robbins, I think, said like a legacy is like a garden you'll never see. Um, you plant the seeds, you nurture the soil, and then you don't actually get to see the flowers or the fruit. Um, and so my whole 14 years of my life, I have blood, sweat, tears, um, worked harder than anyone I know at making sure people feel seen, heard, loved, celebrated, and encouraged in their journeys. And so, um, yeah, just the legacy of that, just the legacy that one day someone was living a life and they've met me or someone that maybe I worked with even like the ripple effect goes and they, and they, for the first time in their life, they're like, that's the first time I ever felt really heard and really seen and really loved and really celebrated. Um, and if I did that to someone then I pray they can do that for someone. And then I pray that legacy just lives on. Even if it's not my name, I actually don't even care. Um, my highest excitement right now is I'm creating leaders, heart led mentors. And I have a program that when the program's over, the people in the program that I created don't even talk about my name. They're just like, oh my God, my mentor changed my life forever. Mitch, Janelle, um, David, all Sam, all these people like they, and, and they don't even use my name once. And, and for me, that's like the ultimate goal is, is to create, um, heart led leaders and mentors and, and heroes. So, yeah. yeah. BC, I'm, I'm really inspired by you, brother. Um, and I'm so grateful that we could have this special conversation and this connection. I know there's a long journey ahead of us uh, to be on this mission together. I really support all that you're doing. And I'm really happy that people that are listening got to hear your message and your story. Um, appreciate you so much. And I'm excited for what's to come, brother. Thank you. Love you, man. Peace, brother. So excited for you to be part of the mastermind. These next six weeks should be dope. And for, I'm excited for this podcast to be released. So. Yes, sir. All the love, brother. Peace, brother. Peace.